Welcome everyone to this webinar. My name is Tara Lee. I'm the engagement lead from the Open Data Institute. I'm joined today by Sonia Cooper, who is Assistant General Counsel in IP Policy and Strategy, Fatima Kathari, the Senior Program Manager for the Airban Initiative, both from Microsoft, as well as John Busby, Managing Director of Broadband Now. You'll be hearing from each of us today discussing different aspects of the Education Open Data Challenge launched by Microsoft and the Open Data Institute. And we will finish this session with a Q&A. If you'd like to ask any questions throughout this webinar, please type your questions into the box, which you should hopefully see on the right hand side of your screens. And I'll cover these off with the speakers at the end of the session. This webinar is being recorded and I shared with and will be shared with everyone who's pre-registered for the Education Open Data Challenge, which should hopefully be all of you here. But if you did find out about this session from an alternative source, please do pre-register for the challenge. Uh, it's via the link in the overview, which should be just below this video on the page to ensure that we've got your email address so we can send the recording to you. And to start things off, I'll give you a brief overview of the challenge before handing over to John, who will be giving you an introduction to the data set Broadband Now is opening up for this challenge. He'll be followed by Fatima, who will introduce you to Microsoft's Airband initiative with global operations to expand internet connectivity to unserved rural communities in over 20 countries. We'll then hear from Sonia, who will introduce you to the data set Microsoft are opening up for the first time for this challenge covering broadband utilization data and the differential privacy methodology used with it. I'll then give you an overview of some additional data sets that we've sourced to get participants of the challenge started, as well as providing some tips and guidance on how to use open data. So before I move on, just a quick reminder that if you do have any questions throughout each of our presentations, please do put those in the box on the left and we'll go through these in the Q&A at the end of the webinar. Now to give you an overview, this is an open data challenge focusing on education run by Microsoft and the ODI with Broadband Now who are a partner providing some data for you to make use of. We decided to run this challenge following the pretty tough year that we've all had and particularly focusing on education as we know the COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted learning for more than 1.6 billion children and youth worldwide. Many governments around the world have closed educational institutions in an attempt to stop the spread of the virus. And in response, schools and teachers have attempted to reach their students remotely through distance learning tools and platforms, a bit like how we're, we're reaching you today. Uh, and this has posed a number of challenges for students and their families, as well as teachers and education decision makers. And what we've seen highlighted is the unequal access to digital services, the digital divide, which is resulting in some children, especially from, for those from marginalized groups or low income backgrounds, not having the same opportunities as their peers to access the education they need. And this having a huge impact on the world's most vulnerable learners. So for this challenge, we're asking participants to identify the correlation between broadband penetration and the delivery of education services online and come up with new and innovative solutions to help close the digital divide. We want you to consider questions like, how do students access remote learning, especially those who may not have easy access to digital, digital infrastructure like technology and internet connectivity? What level of digital access to learning do students from disadvantaged groups have relative to more advantaged groups? And what's the relationship between levels of digital skills and learning outcomes for different demographics? We'd like teams to identify these gaps in digital infrastructure that affect delivery of education services online for children and young adults and the potential impacts on learning outcomes, and then suggest innovative and realistic solutions to address these gaps at the lowest costs. And the solution should address either the steps that governments, education providers, businesses or society can take to help students have equal access to education in areas affected by a lack of digital infrastructure, or how education system leaders can most effectively improve digital access to enable equal learning for all students, or how one can develop the skills needed to make online learning tools and platforms inclusive and effective to students from disadvantaged communities. To help you do this, you'll have access to data from Microsoft and Broadband Now that will be made available for the first time as part of this open data challenge. 
Additionally, we'll be sharing a list of relevant open data sets from trusted international source, uh, international organizations, which can be used in conjunction with the other data sets. We encourage you to use these to answer the challenge questions, but these are not a finite list of resources, and we welcome teams to use any further relevant data sets they have access to, provided the data has a license that supports that use. Next week, we'll be launching a platform to support you through this challenge, which will include all of the resources that I've discussed, as well as a community channel on Slack to help individuals who do not have a, a ready form team so that they can share their own profiles and identify others they could work with, with complementary skills or experience. So in terms of a timeline from next Thursday, you'll have one month to register your teams on the platform and then a further three weeks to write a 300 word proposal outlining the scope of your work and submit these on the platform. You'll then have two months to develop your challenge solutions before a panel of judges with expertise in, in data science and education will review and shortlist the top solutions. The shortlisted teams will then have the opportunity to present their solutions to the judging panel on the 1st of May next year, and the winners will then be announced. And the overall winners will be able to choose an eligible nonprofit organization of their choice to award £50,000 to, with the two runners-up each having £30,000 and £20,000 respectively to give to the eligible nonprofit of their choice. If you would like to read more details about the challenge, you can find these on the pre-registration page link, which, as I mentioned before, is below the video screen in the overview section of this site. And if you have any questions you would like to ask about the challenge now, please put these in the box on the right-hand side of your screens, and we'll endeavor to answer these during the Q&A at the end of the webinar. Now, without further ado, I will pass over to John Busby, Managing Director of Broadband Now. Welcome, John. Hi, thanks for thanks for having me. I'm really glad to uh, to be here. And um, and James, do you mind popping up my my slides <clears throat> while I'm waiting for the for the slides to come up? Just want to say good morning to everybody. Um, if you're, I'm on the west coast of of uh, of the United States in Seattle. If you're tuning in from Europe or elsewhere, good afternoon, good good evening. Okay, I see my slides are up there. It's kind of shocking uh, to see what I looked like prior to the pandemic um, in a nice office with a blazer and shirt. <laughs> now, now I need a haircut, and I'm in I'm in uh, I'm in my attic. Uh, but but I'm really really thrilled to be part of this uh, education open data challenge with Microsoft and and ODI. Um, it's really important to us at Broadband Now to do everything we can to close uh, the digital divide. Uh, we do a significant amount of, of research in, in our organization, but we've really only be able, been able to scratch the surface of, um, of the digital divide and how it impacts education. And I'm very excited about the outcome of this challenge. So if we move on to, uh, to the next slide, I'll give you an overview of, of us at, at Broadband Now. So we're a data resource for consumers, uh, concerned citizens, policymakers, and research researchers about internet service in America and the digital divide. Our mission is that every American should have access to broadband internet. And we estimate that 42 million Americans do not. Um, so in addition to what we do on the research side, we also have what you could consider uh, uh, like a search engine for ISPs for um, consumers to find and compare local internet service providers. You can see the results of my zip code 98144 in Seattle on screen. Uh, I have three primary providers that service my zip code, um, CenturyLink, uh, which provides uh, fiber internet and Xfinity and Wave, which are cable providers. And then on the right-hand side, um, you can you can click into I think this is CenturyLink and see the uh, uh, the the internet plans, pricing, and other information. So 10 million Americans use this today. Next slide, please. So, like I said, um, we have. We've done a pretty significant amount of, of research on the digital divide, but we've only scratched the surface on how digital access impacts education. Here are just some data points that, that we've discovered 
this year, maybe to get the, the juices flowing as you're digging into the data sets that we'll be releasing. First is in the United States, there are more than 100 counties where less than half the population is wired for broadband and at least 30% of children aged five to 17 live below the poverty line. So, um, so this is obviously a really big issue for education. Even in King County, the county where, where I live, um, Seattle, you know, the home to, to many large companies, um, there are an estimated 31,000 children living in, in poverty and uh, a broadband penetration rate of not 100%, it's 99%, which may seem like a lot, but it's still 1% of the population in, in Seattle that doesn't have access to broadband. And then finally, we surveyed uh, Americans this spring and more than half of respondents had to cancel an appointment, medical appointment due to COVID-19. Telehealth is a potential solution to this um, and there's widespread acceptance of this as an alternative to in-person medicine. But if Americans don't have access to a broadband connection, uh, telehealth is going to be a challenge. And we know that health is a big part of having an effective education. So um, these are just a few, few data points to get the, the juices flowing. The next slide, please. So let me describe, take the rest of, of, of my part of the presentation here to describe the data that we're releasing and where it comes from. So Broadband Now has the largest database of plans, pricing, and coverage uh, for American internet service providers. And our base data comes from the FCC. As you probably know, internet service providers are required to submit something called a Form 477 twice a year, which provides information on, um, on the, the census blocks in which the ISP offers service, along with some information on, on technology and speed. Our coverage is enhanced by several hundred providers who submit updates to Broadband Now directly. Providers do that because they want um, up-to-date information on our site, and F FCC um, data tends to be 12 to 18 months behind. Um, third is that we manually collect plan, pricing, and coverage data for all 2,500 ISPs in the US, and we have for the last five years. So every, every month, it's a pretty laborious process. We, we understand every plan offered to Americans, and we map that down to the zip code. And then finally, you'll see speed test data in our data set uh, at the zip code level. That's collected from uh, Measurement Labs, which is an open data source, but then we associate that with ISPs and, and, and zip codes. If you'd like to see like a visual representation of our data set, I've included a URL there on the slide, broadbandnow.com slash national dash broadband dash map. So just to give you a, a sense for the data that we'll be providing in a raw form. Next slide, please. Um, so what exactly are we releasing? So we're releasing a snapshot of access and coverage data by zip code um, from 2020 and then also from 2015. So this will allow you to um, compare, uh, sort of compare progress in different parts of the country or, or, or by zip code and also tie this over to long-term educational outcomes. We also have, um, pricing data from uh, autumn 2020 by zip code, speed test data by zip code, which covers the last 12 months. And this is the first data set of, the kind, of this kind that we've ever released or that's ever been released. So we're very, very proud to, to do that. Next slide, please. Um, just one important note about our license. Um, if you publish any subset of the data or material analysis of this data on your own, um, please provide linked attribution to our website. Thank you. Okay, next slide. All right, this is this is the last slide, and I, I just wanted to actually show you um, the the specific data that we'll be releasing and describe the um, uh, e each each piece of data. So there are two zip codes here. There's nine eight one four four, which is my zip code. And then 36003, which I think is the top row of our data set 
al alphabetically. It's the first um, zip code in Ottawa, which is a county in Alabama. And so um, there's the zip code, there's the population of the zip code according to the US Census in 2010, the county, the state, and then wired count underscore 2020 is the number of wired providers present in a zip code. So that's cable, copper, DSL, or fiber. Then the number of fixed wireless providers present in the zip code. And then the number of providers of any technology present in, in a zip code. What's the delta there? So why would there be nine or, or 10? Um, that includes um, providers like, like satellite. Then the, the, there's a, the number of wired providers in a zip code offering speeds of at least 25 MIPS down, three MIPS up, which is the FCC definition for broadband internet. So you can see that in NIST County in Alabama, there aren't any, in, in my zip code, there are four. And then we also provide the number of wired providers that offer at least 100 MIPS um, download, three up which is the broadband definition standard that broadband now advocates that, that we think is, is right. And then finally, the number of providers of any technology in a zip code offering speeds of at least 25 down and, and, and three up. The difference here is usually um, satellite providers. Then there's the number of speed tests conducted in that zip code from the last 12 months the average download speed of um, those speed tests, and then the 90th percentile download speed of those speed tests. That data is really important because um, there can sometimes be a disconnect between the type of, of service that's offered and what consumers <clears throat> are actually getting on the ground. And then finally, this is a really interesting data point as well, which is the lowest priced terrestrial broadband plan, broadband defined as um, 25 down, 25 MIPS download, three up, and uh, and the, the and terrestrial meaning wired or fixed wireless. And then you can see the percent of the ZIPS population that has access to this technology. These um, final data points at the bottom are the same as the ones at the top. They're just a, a snapshot of June, 2015. Um, when you access our data set, um, when, when we make it available next week, uh, you'll see detailed um, descriptions of, of all of these. Thanks for letting me go through this. Like I said, we're really excited to be part of the challenge, and thanks very much. I'll pass it back to Tara. Thanks, John. That was really useful. I think everyone will be really interested to have a look at that data in more detail. Uh, if anyone has any questions for John about the Broadband Now data set, please put these in the box on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, and now I'll pass over to Fatima, who will be giving you all an introduction to Microsoft's Airband initiative. Over to you, Fatima. And uh, I just realized I was speaking on mute. So let me restart that uh, again. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Fatima, and I'm the senior program manager with Microsoft's Airband Initiative. Thank you for uh, this opportunity to talk about the Airband Initiative today. Um, I'm excited to share a little bit about our work and hopefully provide some food for thought for this open data challenge. I will not be focusing on data sets. I think John is kind of the expert on that, but I'll be talking a little bit more about impact uh, as well as use cases once uh, data is available to actually uh, target unserved people who don't have access to broadband or other cases like education at the moment. So as you'll see on the next slide, uh, Microsoft was really founded um, and probably one slide more. Uh, Microsoft was founded on this idea that democratizing access to technology would enable more people to reach their full potential. In July 2017, we launched the Airband Initiative, both as a call to action, as well as a programmatic effort to help close the rural broadband access gap in the United States, as well as around the world, and really deliver on our company's core mission to empower communities to achieve more. So as you'll see on the next slide, 
for many of us, you know, when we think about high speed internet access, we think about it as being something as ubiquitous as electricity or running water. From the comfort of our own homes, especially during the pandemic, we're able to attend uh, courses, we're uh, on track with degrees, we're able to shop for products around the world and just collaboratively seamless, uh, collaborate seamlessly with all of our colleagues who are working in different time zones. And this new level of connectedness has fostered growth in all of our educational institutions, our economies, and overall in our governments. But when you think about as a global population, all of us haven't benefited equally. Nearly half of the world's population still does not use internet. And you'll see out here that uh, there's a significant gap in the number of people uh, that lack access to electricity as well, which is kind of the backbone for most broadband infrastructure. So as you'll see on the next slide, um, you know, when you think about just the US specifically, the slide does use FCC numbers. When you look at the broadband coverage data that's issued by the FCC, we know that at least 18.3 million people, over 14 million of which reside in rural areas, lack access to broadband. And there's very strong evidence as showcased by independent data sets from Microsoft, from Broadband Now, that the percentage of Americans without broadband access is actually much higher than the figures reported by the FCC. Um, on the next slide, you'll see that, you know, when you think about it from a global perspective, uh, three of our focus areas are Latin America, Asia, and Africa. And in these parts of the world, at least 3 billion people are not using the internet and over 1 billion people lack reliable access to energy. Uh, to compound this, uh, the UN State of Broadband report recently found that broadband adoption had actually slowed down. And progress is especially elusive in low economic, low income countries and rural areas around the globe. So when you think about, uh, you know, the connected uh, population, only 57% of global households actually have an in-home in internet subscription. And like I mentioned, 1.1 billion people lack reliable access to energy, which makes broadband connectivity even more difficult. When you think about this gap, the gap actually disproportionately affects those that are low income, that are elderly, that are low literacy, uh, female located in rural areas. And rural areas, especially from an infrastructure perspective, are very disadvantaged because traditional telecom infrastructure fails to go the final mile in low density regions. So uh, as you'll see on the next slide, you know what we're really trying to do with Microsoft's Airband initiative is strike up partnerships with telecom equipment makers, energy, internet and energy access providers and local entrepreneurs to make affordable broadband access a reality for unserved communities around the world. Uh, within the U.S., our partners are projected to cover at least 3 million people who do not have broadband access in rural areas by July 2022. Through our international partnerships, we're projected to extend internet connectivity to at least 40 million unserved people by July 2022. And we take a really unique approach that you'll see on our next slide. Um, this definitely is not an initiative that we do on our own. We're not going out and becoming a direct uh, connectivity provider. We really do this by working with a network of people all working on the same goal, connecting people and bringing with that connectivity the opportunity for a better life. Um, the next slide actually shows a really good map of all of our projects around the world. You'll see that there's uh, been a significant ramp up in the U.S. over the last three years where we really kind of uh, expanded our presence significantly and made significant progress against our goals. Uh, we're moving full steam ahead to accelerate our work even further, and we have large scale projects, pilots, um, as well as grand projects in 20 countries. Uh, in the US, we have large scale commercial projects in 26 states and territories. And uh, globally, all of the dots that you see out here on the slide today, we have about 100 projects active in countries where we have a presence. Uh, our impact to date, um, through, through all of our projects, we've helped provide 
over 2 million people with access to broadband in rural, previously unserved areas of the U.S., and over 8 million people overall that reside in these geographies. Through the international projects outside our U.S., we've helped provide access to broadband to over 16 million people. So as you'll see on the next slide, um, we do have focus areas and here's where I was talking about like, you know, connectivity is kind of foundational, but there's a lot of use cases that we build upon through our projects. And we are focused on expanding broadband to bring digital transformation in four key areas. That's healthcare, agriculture, education, and small business enablement or rural entrepreneurship. Um, Microsoft's position really is that broadband is the electricity of the 21st century, and it's critical to fuel economic and social opportunities, whether that be starting a small business, improving outcomes in healthcare, improving outcomes in education, supporting innovation in agriculture to increase yield. These digital transformation efforts can help level the playing field for billions of people. One particular area I do want to double click on today is the broadband gap in education or the homework gap. So as part of our first project in the U.S., we partnered with private and public entities to use a technology called TV wide space to wirelessly extend connectivity, provide home Internet access for students residing in Southern Virginia's Halifax and Charlotte counties. In another early airband project, we, partners, we partnered with diverse stakeholders in Northeastern Michigan to provide internet access on school buses, again, leveraging TV white space as a technology. And today we're working with the Grand Island School District in central Nebraska on a pilot that leverages fixed wireless connectivity to bring broadband access to students across the data, across the district. Uh, the state of Nebraska is actually now exploring use of that model to address the homework gap in other parts of the state. And of course, the broadband gap perpetuated inequity in access to education well before the pandemic and well before COVID-19 ever um, uh, came into our lives. Uh, but now with social distancing, uh, forcing many of us to work, communicate and connect in new ways, Students in particular risk falling further behind in remote learning without access to high-speed internet. So one example I did want to highlight on the next slide is of our partner CalNet, which is an ISP based out in the Central Valley of California. Uh, their work to address the homework gap has intensified in light of COVID-19. You know, uh, CalNet is working with public school districts, community college systems, other educational entities in the Central Valley to provide home broadband, broadband access to students who otherwise would not have access to the uh, to the service before uh, the pandemic hit. Uh, as Airband, we're supporting CalNet's effort to bundle affordable devices, which is kind of step two after you have internet access at home, software as well as free skilling resources along with connectivity for students and families in this highly agriculture region. So with that, um, I do want to thank you for your time to learn a bit more about the Airband Initiative today. Uh, thank you also to the Open Data Institute and Broadband Now for partnering with us on this really important cause. Uh, We've come a long way and our commitment to work to ensure ubiquitous access to broadband is stronger than ever. Um, together with our partners, we're really hoping to impact the lives of hundreds of millions, if not billions of people by delivering broadband internet access and improving livelihoods in those communities. And data really is foundational to all of the work that we do because we always say that uh, we can't really solve a problem that we don't measure and we can't understand. So thank you so much for participating in the Open Data Challenge. Thank you, Fasma. That was really interesting to hear about. Um, just a reminder, if you have any questions for Fatima or John, please put these in the box on the right-hand side of your screen and we will cover these in the Q&A at the end. Now I will pass over to Sonia to give you a preview of the data that Microsoft will be opening up for this challenge. Thanks, Sonia. 
Thanks very much, Tara. Hi, everyone. I'm Sonia Cooper. I'm in the Open Innovation team at Microsoft. The work of the Airband team has shown that there's a real lack of accurate data on broadband availability. So let's consider the US. The Federal Communications Commission, or FCC, issued a broadband report in 2019 indicating that over 21 million people do not have access to broadband in the US. Getting these numbers right is really important. The data is used by governments and local agencies to decide how to invest in broadband. And we know that investment is really critical, particularly at this time when there's such a dependency on broadband for services like education. The figures previously released by the FCC didn't appear to match the experiences of the airband team. And so our data science team wanted to explore this further. Using anonymized data from our services, in 2018, we found that 162.8 million people were not using the internet at broadband speeds. More recent analysis shows that this has improved slightly with now 157.3 million people not using the internet at broadband speeds. Our results seem to align with the FCC's broadband subscription data, which suggests that the data sets are far closer to the mark than the broadband access data reported by the FCC. So what could be the reason for this overestimation by the FCC? One reason seems to be that the request form, the 477 uh, that John mentioned, collects broadband data um, from providers and the questions seem to be too broad. Uh, they are asking um, whether providers are providing or could provide without extraordinary commitment of resources, broadband services in a particular area. And so a lot of the problem is actually masked. Uh, next slide, please. So in April of this year, Microsoft made the data from this analysis available under an open use data agreement. As you can see here, data is provided at the county level. The broadband availability as reported by the FCC is shown against the broadband usage as analyzed by Microsoft. These figures differ significantly. For example, in Baldwin County, the FCC reported that broadband is available to 80%, sorry, 88% of the county. Our analysis shows that, however, only 30% of the county is actually using the internet at broadband speeds. And while this information is useful, the lack of location information means that it's actually hard to target areas that have particular trouble accessing broadband. Next slide, please. So next week, we'll be making a zip code level view of this information available. Given that the zip code level data provides a more granular view, we took the additional step to ensure data privacy guarantees by applying differential privacy. So differential privacy is a technique that adds noise to data aggregations, preventing data leakage about the presence of specific individuals in a data set. We implemented the differential privacy through the Smart Noise platform. This is a first of its kind open source platform for differential privacy that was co-developed by Microsoft and the OpenDP initiative by Harvard. As differential privacy adds noise, the noise added to zip codes with small numbers of households can impact the utility of that data. So to ensure transparency into how the zip codes with different populations are affected, we're actually including an error range with the data that we're providing. So for each specific zip code, the given error range can be understood as the actual broadband estimate without differential privacy applied would fall within the range, either plus or minus 95% of the time. Now that's 95% of the time because differential privacy is a, is a analysis based on probability. And so by applying differential privacy to the same set of results, you're not going to necessarily get the same data. We'll be pointing to additional resources um, to actually help you understand the data when the data is made available. But I'm really looking forward to seeing how this data set is used in the challenge. Over to Tara, thank you. Thanks for taking us through that, Sonia. Um, 
As always, if you have any questions for Sonia or any of the speakers today, please put those in the box on the right hand side of your screen and we will cover those in just a few minutes. But first of all, I'm going to give you a preview of some of the data sets that we have sourced and collated from other organizations who have published their data with an open license and just try and give you some helpful tips for finding and using different open data sets for this challenge. So when Microsoft and the ODI came up with this challenge, we knew we had some data sets that we wanted to open up and share, but we also wanted this challenge to be about data collaborations too. So what we've got on the next slide is just a sample of the data sets that we've curated from some trustworthy international organizations. And this is not by any means a definitive list. This slide just covers a sample of what we've curated, which in turn is only a sample of the incredible amount of data that's out there to find. Uh, and what we wanted to do was just give you a starting point to hopefully inspire your proposals and get you started on your challenge. By no means do you need to use all or even some of the data sets that I've listed on this slide. Uh, we encourage you to find additional sources of data, though it's very important that you ensure you have the permission to use that data via an open license. As I've mentioned, these data sets, they're not the ODIs or Microsoft or Broadband Nows. Um, we found them on other sites from trustworthy international sources. So we don't have any ownership or responsibility for this data, nor can I claim to be an expert on what each of these sets contain. But just to give you an idea, if I were to go to the first link on this slide, uh, this is the UNESCO Institute for Statistics site. And as the official statistical agency of UNESCO, the UIS produces a wide range of databases that are free for all UNESCO countries and regional groupings. And once you've clicked on it, you'll see all of the data sets they have published on the left hand side grouped by themes. Uh, themes are things like national monitoring or by demographics and socioeconomic statistics. And if you were to click on one of these themes like national monitoring, you'll see a detailed breakdown of the full data set. Uh, and that will include things like mean years of schooling by country worldwide or repetition rate by grade. So just to give you an idea, uh, if we go back to the slide, you'll see we've included other sites like the OECD Education Database, which contains a number of qualitative and quantitative data sets based on their worldwide surveys. And the World Bank Education Statistics, which has a portal, uh, which is a portal of comprehensive data and analysis uh, for key topics in education, such as access, completion, learning expenditures, policy, and equity. So hopefully by looking through the data sets that we found for you and exploring the additional types of data that are available, this will help inspire you in forming your proposals, as well as give you a great volume of data to work with to come up with conclusions and recommendations. If we go on to the next slide, I really just want to reiterate the importance of making sure you have permission to use the data that you find in this challenge. Usually the data license will be stated with the data set. And what you need to see is if it has an open license, like the example that I've included here, which is stated by the World Bank. If you can't find a license with the data or somewhere on the data provider's website, it's really important that you check with that data provider that you have permission to use this data for your analysis. Not all data that you can access online, that you can read online is necessarily open. So please don't just assume that it is. You do need to check this. And moving on to the next slide, if you are new to using open data and you're unfamiliar with data licenses or you're not necessarily a data scientist yourself and analyzing data sets like this is something you haven't done before, or you don't feel fully confident in doing so, we've put together some free tools and training for you to use, which should hopefully help. So Microsoft has provided two types of training to support participants in using Azure tools, which could help you when you're collating different data sets, for example, to try and find relationships between them. And then the ODI, the Open Data Institute, as our name suggests, we're big fans of encouraging use and publishing of open data as long as it's done responsibly. Uh, and we have a number of guides and e-learning tools for you to use. So this includes a guide for data users, which is what participants in this challenge will be. Uh, and that's on the data licensing, which as I've mentioned, is really important to be mindful of. We also have e-learning modules on open data essentials 
and finding the stories in data sets, as well as a guide on how to anonymize data sets for participants that want to contribute their own data. And related to this last guide, if you do have your own data sets that you want to contribute to the challenge um, or to your own research, this guide can be useful in case there is a risk of identifying individuals from those data sets. Uh, they might have been originally created as internal closed documents, but they need to be responsibly uh, anonymized before they can be shared openly. So I would recommend, you know, even if you think a data set from your organization is safe to use for this challenge in terms of anonymization, um, I would recommend just reading this guide first to make sure you're handling that data responsibly. So that's everything from me. And we can now move on to the Q&A portion of this webinar. So as I've mentioned a few times now, please do put your questions into the box on the right hand side of your screen and we will start to go through those now. Uh, so the first question I can see here is from Kerry at UNT. Uh, is the provider's info organized by three distinct types, wired, fixed wireless, and any technology? I'm wondering if counts are distinct or overlapping. And that's a really good question. Uh, John, did you want to come in on that one? Yeah, I, I can take that. With the Broadband Now data set, um, there, there is a, a wired count, which is distinct, it's just wired. There's a fixed wireless count, which is also distinct. And there's an all providers, which is um, every technology, including satellite. So the all, the all providers is, is, is not distinct, it's overlapping. Um, there are a couple of, of data um, elements that use the term terrestrial. And terrestrial is meant to say all wired plus fixed wireless. So essentially it's everyone but satellite um, satellite technology. And we have a detailed description uh, on, our, on our data set when it's released. Great, thanks John. And I think that's really important. Um, that question from Kerry is really important to think about when any of you are looking at any of the data sets is just, just make sure you ask yourself those questions. Is it clear? whether different columns are distinct or whether there could be overlapping data. Um, and in most cases, you should be able to ask the data providers if you're not sure if it's not clear there. Obviously, in some cases, you know, they may not come back to you quickly or they may not come back to you at all. Um, but it is worth just asking yourselves that question when you are analyzing the data. We, we do have a, um, uh, a support email in our description and we will get back to you. So if you have any questions about our data set, let us know. Yeah, so Broadband Now are the gold standard of feedback on their, on their data, which is really good to hear. Uh, do we have any more questions come through? Don't think we've had any at the moment. I do know that there's a 30 second delay also with this. So uh, we'll, give it, we'll give it a couple of minutes. Um, I think we've, we've had a question in the past, which I just wanted to really clarify on, um, which was around can individuals who are participating in the challenge contribute their own data sets. Um, and I, I touched on this in, in my last presentation. I just want to uh, really kind of reiterate the point that if you have data within your own organizations or data sets that you have access to that, or you found yourself that we haven't sourced and you want to use them, uh, and you're confident that you've got a license on the data or you it's your data, you can apply that license, uh, and you're willing to share that with other participants of the challenge because this is a, an open data challenge. We want to you know, work openly if we can. Uh, please do let us know. We have got a, um, a questions button on the pre-registration form on the landing page, which, as I mentioned, there's a link in the overview section on this page. Uh, so if you do want to share any data yourselves, then please do put that put that question in there and we will come back to you on that and, and work with you to get that up on the up on the platform when that goes live next week, uh, which is also where all of the data sets that we've talked about today will be listed uh, from the 10th. Uh, another question that's come through is, will the Microsoft data contain explanation on how fields were determined slash interpreted? Sonia, did you want to come on that one? Uh, yes, so there, there will be some additional information on how to interpret those those fields. Um, but essentially, the, the broadband usage is really a percentage 
of the households within a particular county or zip code um, which are using broadband at um, um, broadband speed <laughs> rates. Great, thank you, Sonia. Okay, uh, I think we'll probably wrap up there because we've been going. We've been going for forty-five minutes now. Um, if anyone has any other questions that occur to them after the webinar has finished, then please go to our landing page and put your questions in there. Uh, and if it's directed at one of the speakers in particular, uh, just mention that in there so that it's clear, and we'll make sure that that question goes to them, and we'll we'll give you a response. Um, and likewise, if you are watching the recording of this webinar back and you've got any questions, please go through the same process and we will endeavour to answer your questions as soon as possible. So all that is left for me to do is just thank our speakers in the call. Thank you all for your time and your contributions and the efforts that everyone has put in. Thank you to all of the participants who have joined today. Uh, we appreciate it. We've got a, a global uh, interest in this challenge, which is fantastic news. It does mean scheduling live events like this is a bit of a challenge because of the time zone differences for everyone. So if you've gotten up really early or you've stayed up really late to join this, again, really appreciate you joining. Uh, and we look forward to seeing everyone who, pre who registers for the challenge and seeing all the proposals that get submitted. So thank you, everyone. Have a good Friday. It's Friday morning, Friday evening, whatever it is, uh, and enjoy your weekends. Thank you. Thank you.